Good morning, folks. Right, guys, this morning, I'm going to be running through the Edexcel IAL Chemistry October. Good morning, folks. Oh, let's turn that off. Always have right, guys, to check the sounds all okay. Um, right, I'll close that now. I'll save my bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this morning, I'm doing the IAL Chemistry October um, Unit 5 exam review. Okay, so... Unit 5 is usually what I deem to be the hardest paper at A-level. It's usually the hardest paper you'll ever sit, really. I'm hoping to do the paper 6 after. See how we get on. If I'm going to share my screen, let's crack on. Or I'll waste your time. Right, I'll switch my camera to my clip cam. There we go. Hello. Okay. Right. All up and running. So let's go. Ugh. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Got my calculator on standby. Be interesting to see how many who turns up in the lesson. <laughs> okay. So uh, usual thing, let's put my name in. Mr. Duncan. Okay, so uh, usual multiple choice starting. For IAL, so oh, let's get rid of that. No, that's so to pop myself. Okay, so the enthalpy change of hydrogenation of cyclohexene is minus one twenty. What is the approximate enthalpy change for hydrogenation of benzene? Now that is a, a it's a ridiculously tricky question. That the answer is two ten. Now that's a bit of a nightmare. That one, you just have to know that fact. Just have to know it, which is a bit of a nightmare. I think I'm going to keep with my pen being a little bit thicker. Um, the reason why it's a bit odd, just to do a little bit of teaching at that point, because we've got the two, benzene, of course, is heavy paper five, and we have the, the two images of benzene, which is cyclohexa 135 triene, and then we've got the image of benzene. Now, if we were to hydrogenate cyclohexene, it would be three of them. So the expectation here, because there are three double bonds in, in this particular diagram and there's one in cyclohexene, you would have the expectation that it's going to be minus 360 because it's just going to be the hydrogenation multiplied by three for three of the double bonds. However, benzene has what is called delocalized stability. So what that means is the hydrogenation still requires three hydrogen molecules, but it's, it's a lower uh, it's low. It's less exothermic than would be expected because the benzene is more stable than the cyclohexa-135 triene. And so it immediately rules out the larger number. It could be 150. It could be. It's not, and you just have to know that, I'm afraid, guys. That's just a, a fact. Uh, I would definitely say for all those people studying this that learning the benzene one is a useful one to know. Okay, which orbitals overlap to form the ring of delocalized electrons in benzene, and what type of bond is it? So it is overlapping P's, so it's either him or him, and it is a pi system. So the answer is A here. Just to explain why, so in a, in a double bond, we know the image from GCSE is this. Well, what that in reality is, is a sigma bond as one of them, and then an overlapping P, like there's a sideways overlap of P's to give us the second bond. And if you then have another one, another carbon going up and double bonds being there, what happens is you get overlap of the P's all the way around. So it's a P, P overlap, and it is a delocalized pi system. So A is the right answer. Okay, so. Transformations at A2 are tough because they incorporate everything all the way through from AS and Unit 4 as well. Um, and the reason for that is because in Unit 5, you cover synthesis. And synth synthesis now incorporates absolutely everything. So you've got to know all your transformations. And it's challenging. So what we're doing is we're adding to benzene. We're adding an ACE. We're adding this, um, this, this alkyl. It's, 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 it's a carbonyl group is what it is. Now, the way that we do that is we actually started off with an acyl chloride and you remove the chlorine with an ALCl3. So we need to have, it is going to be an, it's going to be an acyl chloride, so either one of these two, and our catalyst is ALCl3. 
So it's going to be C. Um, again, transformations is one of those ones, but you just have to start learning them. You know that with benzene, we, we essentially do a, a set of reactions with benzene. So if we take benzene, I'm just going to do benzene like this. Um, what we can do is we can do several transformations with benzene. You can add on a nitro group. You can add on a halogen, a flat halogen like Cl, like chlorine. Um, you could add on an alkyl group. You could add on a, a CH3 or an R group. Um, and we can add on our, we can add on our um, carbonyl group, which is this one, C double bond O bond R. So each of these transformations requires a very specific set of reagents. This one, of course, is concentrated nitric acid and sulfuric acid followed, and this one, and they have to be conch, by the way, both, yeah, generating the nitronium ion. This one's going to be chlorine and AlCl3. Then this one's going to be a CH3Cl with AlCl3. And then this one's going to be the C, the, the C double bond O and a Cl, and this is your R group. And again, we're removing, well, you know, so you can see common trends here. Yeah, this is a super nice catalyst because it essentially does all of them. There are others. You can do ALBR3 and stuff like that. And there are also iron-3 chlorides as well, which will also function. And Unit 5 will pick on those, but the, the, there's, there are patterns in it, and there's overlapping knowledge here, which makes it really handy. So in this case, we're adding on this one, and we need the acyl chloride plus the chlorine extractor, which is the aluminium chloride. Chlorine reacts with methyl benzene in the presence of ultraviolet light. So this is FRS. This is free radical substitution. Now, free radical substitution is not one that attacks benzene. Benzene is very specific if you want to add a Cl to it. So this one there, that's the chlorine and AlCl3. So that's not going to be something that's going to be going through FRS. It'll require a very specific one. Now, what you'll notice is that with the methyl benzene, with all of these other products, we've got Cls being attached to the benzene ring, which would require this. What that means is that none of these are possible. It's going to be A. FRS will attack the alkyl, the methyl attachment to the benzene. Next, how many isomers uh, containing benzene ring are molecular formula? That's grim, that, guys. So, ooh, I'm not going to like this. Okay, this one's going to take a bit of time. Be interesting to see how long this takes. So the first thing is to note here is that with benzene, you only get mono substitutions on each carbon. This, this is not a thing. You can't get two of them. The reason being is at each corner of benzene is a single hydrogen. So that what that means is you can only have a single substitution, a mono sub. You can't get an extra. Yeah, you can't do that. that that's not possible. So what that means is we can just put the, nitro, the nitro groups at these particular positions and then try and figure out how many other options there are. So that would be... A, this is a one, two, three um, attachment. I'm going to keep the alcohol group in the same place and move around the nitro. So then we're going to have a one, two, four attachment. I can move the nitro again. Students often ask me why I keep the hydroxyl group in the same place. Well, the reason being is if you play around with this long enough, you start to realize that, oh, uh, hey, Kayun, it's lovely to see you. Um, Kayan's one of my year 13s, one of my best, in fact. Uh, Kayan, I hope you found this useful. If you've got any questions, please help me out. It's always really useful to have a student on, on hand to be asking any questions if they get confused. Yeah, going back to that hydroxyl group, when you, when you have these, like, tri-subs here, then what that means is if you keep one in a fixed position and move all the, the other two around, you, it means that you'll always hit all the isomers. I know that's a fairly vague explanation, but it's just something that kind of comes with playing around with these things. So I've got a one, two, uh, one, so that was, that was a one, two, four. This is a one, two, five. And now I'm going to go for a one, two, six. Okay. I'm just going to do that. It doesn't, of course, it doesn't make any difference. I know that that's not particularly nice writing on that one, but it doesn't really matter because it's multiple choice. I'm certainly up to four at the minute. I'll keep the hydroxyl group in the same place. Now, so I've got, I've got one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five, one, two, six. Now I'm going to go for the one, three. One, three, four. That's that's one, three, four. That's possible. It's not the same. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to go for another one. Going to move one, three, five. Going to go for that guy there. 
uh, sorry, 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 apologies, apologies. There you go, one and then, and then NO2 over here. So I'm up to six so far. Now, at this point, uh, I've eliminated four from the list. I've eliminated five from the list. I'm up to six or seven. So the question is now, is it six or seven? And this is the tricky part, really, because at this point, I'm going to continue to keep the hydroxyl group where it is. But if I now keep that NO2 there and I move this one up to this point, that one now, but this one now becomes the same as, same as uh, that guy. Nope. Same as that guy. <laughs> so I've come all the way full circle. So I'm going to go for six. I'm not going to lie. That's a horrible question. That That is just something that is almost not even worth the one mark, in my opinion. Uh, it's going to be six or seven. I'm not I'm going to say it's six, but I, I still think it could be seven. It, I'm not going to spend any more time bouncing around, though. Phenol reacts with ethanol chloride to form, okay, so ALCL3 catalyst, oh, yield, okay, and they've given us all the MRs at least. In an experiment, we start, we, in an experiment, 3.67 grams of phenol ethanoate, and it was an 85% yield. In an experiment, 3.67 grams of phenol ethanoate was formed, giving an 80%, 85% yield. What was the starting mass of phenol? Okay, so the first thing, in order to use this percentage, we've always got to get to moles. So number of moles is grams over rams. So, and they've given us the MR, which is kind of makes sense, because otherwise it's going to be a horrible question for one mark. 3.67 divided by 136. So that gives me 0 0.026270. Now, the ratio is 1 to 1, but it's an 85% yield. So if this was 85%, we can work out what 100% would have been. I'm going to divide that number by 85, because that's going to get me down to 1%, which is 3.175 times 10 to the minus 4, which means I would have had 3.175 times 10 to the minus 4. Oh, no, no, sorry, that's 1%. Now I'm going to multiply. That's 1. That's 1%. Now I'm going to multiply that by 100, so times 100 takes me to 100. So if it had been a 100% yield, I would have had 0 0.317 moles of it. And that would have been 3101, sorry, 3, damn it, 0 0.0317 moles of that. Multiply that by the MR of 94, and it's going to give me the grams. 2.98, there we go, done. Uh, does this have anything to do with the orthometer power directing groups, or are they just sticking NO wherever? They're just sticking NO wherever, Kayun. Blimey, if you want to start, if you want to start saying where they're gonna go, that becomes a whole lot more tricky. So the OH group is an activating group and is or and is uh, pushes electrons into the dilo. Uh, does it? Yeah. Uh, orthometer power projecting. I always forget that bit, Kayun. It, it's ugh. so the, the thing is, you see, the OH group is an activating group, it adds to the ring. What that means is it is definitely activating, but in terms of its orthometer power projecting, the chlorine groups are the odd, the, the halogens are the weirdos, they, they project where they shouldn't project. But um, an OH group. You tend to link activating to, because it's going to, I'd have to bounce around through my tautomers. It's a horrible question, that, Kayun. Yeah, if you start, if you want to do that and say, where would they actually go? What would happen is, you see, if, if you reach, if you attack it with an NO2 plus, yeah, that double bond is going to break. And if it was to go, and if you put it here, yeah, so you have H and the NO, NO2 plus there. That becomes positive. That can bounce to this corner. That could bounce then to this corner. Right. Well, because it's an activating and pushes it, that should stabilize it. So that should be ortho projecting. Now, let's just check that. It's nice to just, now that she's mentioned ortho meta power projecting, ortho meta, ortho meta power um, there's orthometer power projecting directors. There you go. It's nice to just point out whether or not I was correct on this one. Uh, come on, don't. It's going to give me loads of information I don't want. 
Mm -hmm. Author power. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So the OH groups are as expected. Yeah, they're going to be author power projecting. I have to say, I don't particularly like how they're doing it. Whereas those are withdrawing, so they're going to be meta. Oh, meta? Yeah, meta projecting. Yeah, correct. So I am there. This is ortho. Yeah, ortho. And this is meta. And this is power. Ortho, meta, power. So the NO2 could also go here as well, because that would bounce the plus to there, there, and there again. So, yeah. I hope that makes sense, Kayan. Those particular points, are, it's a really good point to make. Um, I think I have a webinar on ortho meta power projection, but yeah, have a look at it if it's there. A hydrocarbon, uh, let me know, Kayan, if that answers your question. A hydrocarbon containing, ooh, okay, so CH containing 91.3%, therefore 100 minus answer, 100 minus 91.3 gives me 8.7 over 1 over 12 that would be 8.7 91.3 divided by 12 gives me 7.6 divide them all by 7.6 so that's going to be grim isn't it that's going to be 1 and then 8.7 divided by answer oh uh, no 1.14 Right, how do I get that to a whole number? Yuck. Um, grim. So if I times that, five would be 20. So let's do times by six. Nope. 1.14 times by seven. That gives me eight. So if I times that by seven, that gives me a whole number of 7.98. So that's going to be C7H8. Yeah, I'm going to go for B. Nah. I hope that makes sense, guys. That's actually a GCSE question just on steroids. It's very common. What, um, what, is an what is an organic product of the reaction of ethylamine and chloroethane? Okay, so amine, this is going to be nuke sub. That's what it's going to be. Nucleophilic substitution, but with an amine. So where's the O come from? Nope. Um... Ethylamine C2H5NH2, and then this is ethan, ethan, uh, chloroethane. Ah, let's do that one there. There we go. So if I sub that on, if I sub that on there, what's going to happen is we're going to lose a H, and I'm going to have C2H5 attachment. Yeah, totally possible. This one again, an options appeared out of nowhere. In the presence of that, no, that would be a reaction with HCl, so it's going to be D. Yeah, that's a reaction with hydrochloric acid. With the amine, the amine's acting as a base there. Pick up that to form, yeah, to form the salt. That one is a reaction with an acyl chloride. Um, that is an acyl chloride. That's a bit random. Moving on. Which pair of monomers can be form, can form this polymer? Oh, terylene. So this is terylene, guys. Just going to know this one. So you split the condensation polymer down the condensation, down the, um, the, the ester linkage. This is going to be ethane 1,2-diol, which is here. Ethane 1,2-diol and benzene 1,4-dicarboxylic acid, which is that guy. So it's D. Yeah, can't be anyone else. Nice. It can't be. What's interesting is the, the, these two here. Yeah, that wouldn't be the case. The reason being is that wouldn't have the double bond there. That'd be the O linkage. It would be reversed each time. Clever that. I like that. Terylene, D. Part of the structure of protein is shown. How many different amino acids were used to form this part of the structure? Ugh, grim. Okay, so the way I tackle this, guys, is to cut it at the, at the, at the amide linkage for each one. So I'm going to cut it here. Cut it, amide linkage. Amide linkage, amide linkage, amide linkage, amide linkage, amide linkage. Right, now look for the similarities. This is going to be unit number one, which is the same as that one. That one's identical. It's just been reversed and flipped upside down. So this is A, and that's A. This one here is, is that any, that's the same as that guy. 
This one has a, a, a carbon here with nothing attached, carbon here with something attached, carbon there with something attached, carbon there with something attached. That's B. And there's no there's no repeat of this. Then there's this guy, which has been repeated. So that's going to be C. And that's C as well. And then this guy's a real oddity. So that's D. So two A's, two A's, a B, two C's, and a D. So four different ones. Hope that makes sense, Karen. Which organic compound reacts with Grignard's reagent to give a product that forms a secondary alcohol? Okay. So Grignard's, hey Grignard's, doesn't they edit? Grignard's reagent is about extending the carbon chain. R, M, G, uh, B, R. What you do is you take a haloalkane. You take a haloalkane like bromomethane. You react it with magnesium metal in ether under reflux. Really dangerous, by the way. Uh, and what you will form is you form Grignard's reagent, which is this, which is this. And yes, they're covalent bonds, really weird. I believe they're covalent bonds. Now, what you can then do is you can react that with anything with a double bond O. Yeah, anything. So anything with a double bond O can be attacked by Grignard's. Now, just to let you know that you can also react with carbon dioxide as well. It, oh, so the carbon dioxide is linear, by the way. Can react it with CO2 as well. If you react it with CO2, what happens is this little group here breaks away and this attaches on. That's what's happening. Same thing here with any other group with this with this seedable bond O. That will react with Grignard's RMGBR, and it will attach itself on to the to the R group. So you extend the carbon chain. Now, when you do this, the, the, the bromo group also um, leaves with another R group as well. Is that right? Uh, no, it leaves with the H. We form HBR byproduct. Yeah, sure. magnesium bromide. Anyway, not that it matters. What happens is you end up with the R double bonded to the C and then whatever this was. So if it was an aldehyde or ketone, if it was an aldehyde, that would be an H. If it was a ketone, it'd be another R. But you're extending the carbon chain. Now, if you then, it then says in the question that the organic reaction with Grignard extending the chain, to, and if you go through then a hydrolysis on it, you'll form a secondary alcohol. So they're saying if you then reduce this down with something like lithium tetrahydrido aluminate, what's going to happen is you're going to then form the alcohol, and then H goes on there. So... To form a secondary alcohol, it can't be an aldehyde, because if it was an aldehyde, you'd be forming a primary alcohol on reduction. Well, it can't be carbox carbon dioxide either, because that's going to result in a carboxylate, carboxylate salt. Um, car yeah, or carboxylic acids. The aldehydes and the carboxylic and the carbon dioxide rather, but the ketone is going to form your secondary alcohol. Because what happens is the Grignards, which was R that now binds, the R group is now attached to propanone, yeah? And you then reduce that, reduce that, and I know that's got too many bonds, that's why it goes through immediate reduction to form your secondary alcohol, yeah? Can be done, can be done. So the answer is propanone. I hate Grignard's, it's horrible. Extending carbon chains using weird reagents. Okay, a compound with the formula C6H14 gives uh, a C13 NMR with four peaks. So this has symmetry here. One, two, three carbon 13 peaks. This has full molecular symmetry here. So one, two, three, four peaks. Oh, B. Nah. Next one, symmetry, partial symmetry here. One, two, three, four, five. And then this one has full molecular in that and that. So one, two. Nice. Clever. So the answer is B. Cuminone is used as a flavoring. Ugh. What is the molecular formula? Uh, C, 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 and C. So count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven carbons. It's either him or him. Right, it's only on one oxygen, so it's still in. So now they're making us count the hydrogens. Grim. One, two, one, two, three, one, 
one, two, three. There isn't one on these, the on that one and that one. They've been removed by the substitution. Wait, 411, could you explain why it isn't ethanol? Yes, I can. Absolutely. So the reason why it's not ethanol is because if you use Grignards on ethanol, let's draw that out. If you take ethanol and you react it with Grignards, which is R, we can do methyl Grignards if you like, CH3MGBR, yeah? Now, what's going to happen here, Kayun, is that essentially the process is relative, like you, you can actually break it down and work out a mechanism for Grignards. I'm not going to bother, uh, but it can be done. But the point being is this R group here is going to attach onto this guy. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. This guy, of course, that breaks away at that point to allow it to happen. Then we can put it through reduction. Then we can put it through a reduction process. Yeah. And there we go. There's my attachment. And then I add on the alcohol. Now, I oh, I formed a secondary alcohol. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> oh darn it. It's ethanol, not propanone. Oh, uh, I formed a tertiary. I even drew a tertiary. And I did RTFQ. Thanks, Kayun. It's ethanol. Sorry. There you go, guys. I'm as fallible as the next person. I drew a tertiary and then just didn't RTFQ it. Read the full question. The answer's B. I'm an idiot. Thanks, Kayun. That was excellent. I'm glad you asked me to do that. See, I'm as fallible as the next person, guys, and I don't pretend to be perfect. That is definitely not what I'm trying to do here. In fact, what I'm, if anything, trying to show is that don't beat yourself up if you get something wrong. Like, it's just part and parcel of chemistry. These questions are too complicated to be flawless. Anyway, thanks, Kayun. Appreciate it. So, going back to that, I've counted those. So... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. See, I'll do. I won't do it in red. I'll do it in black. There we go. Thanks, Kayan. Much appreciated. Better than me, Kayan. Better than me. Which species contains an element with the same oxidation as bromine in potassium bromate? So, okay, let's first of all break up potassium bromate. So that's going to be O2 minus times 3, so minus 6. This is K plus, uh, plus 1, and then the bromine, therefore, must be bringing plus 5. So this is bromate 5. Next one, so let's now do this guy. So M2O5 got minus 10. That, therefore, must be plus 10, but there's two of them in it. It's plus 5. So A is the answer. Let's check everyone else, though, just for those people who are maybe learning from the process. O2 minus times by 2 is minus 8. Sorry, I do like it doesn't actually matter which direction you put it in. Just pick one. Minus 8, and then this one's going to be plus 1. Like manganese is in a plus 7. And then K2FeO4. So that's minus 8. That's plus 2. So that's going to be iron in plus six. Yeah. And then sodium sulfite. Ooh. Sodium sulfite minus six plus two. Sulfur is in a plus four. There we go. Nice. Which is a redox reaction? Oh, such a pain. So once again, minus 14. Minus 2, so I've got plus 12, plus 6 for chromium. I'm going to shrink my pen here, guys. Carbon is in a 0. Then chromium is in a minus 6, so therefore plus 3. And then carbon, of course, is going to be in a plus 4. So that one is redox. A is the answer. That's nice. So 6 to 3 is reduction, and 0 to plus 4 is oxidation. That one is indeed a redox. Um, let's just check all the others. I don't want to. It's too much time. That one is the one. If you then run everybody else, guys, 
what you'll realize is that they won't show a change in oxidation state. That's what you'll see. So ugh, minus two because each chloride is minus one. So then, then we've got minus four as well. So that's in a plus six. And then this is the chromate ion, which is yellow. So that's minus eight plus, plus six, no change. Chromium hasn't changed, neither does the chlorides. Yeah, so not redox. This is plus six. We've already had that one. Yeah, that's plus six. And then this one is ugh, minus one and then minus, uh, minus six. So that's mm, minus one for the chloride, minus six for the oxygens, but it's in a minus state. So that's going to be plus six from the chromium. No change in the, in the chromium oxidation state. Next one, so this is going to be plus six. We've seen the chromate already. That's yellow going to the plus six dichromate, which is orange. So no change in oxidation state. A was definitely the right answer. The electronic configuration of an atom of an element is this. What is the maximum oxidation? Oh, this is stability of oxidation states in transition metals. What you realize is it's going to lose the 4S first, but then it can also lose a maximum of the 3D5. So this is going to be plus six. It's going to be its maximum oxidation state. Students often ask me, why won't it just form a one plus? They're like, won't it just lose the 4S and then stop and be stable? And I'm like, yes, but it's transition metal. And the transition metals you know, it's the whole point of them is that they form multiple oxidation states. Uh, and I can tell you who this is. This is chromium. And chromium's maximum oxidation state is plus six in the chromate or dichromate ion. So nice question. Which of the following species will not act as a ligand? This one can act as a ligand. It has a lone pair. This one can act as a ligand. It has a lone pair. This one can act as a ligand. It has a lone pair. This one cannot act as a ligand because the ammonium ion has a dative covalent bond that's taking up the nitrogen's lone pair. So it is no longer got the lone pair was used in the formation. That was the lone pair before. This was the acid and it used that to form a bond to it. Sorry, Mr. Duncan, I've got to leave now, but we'll catch it back later. No problem, Kayan. I'm sad you're not here. Winkit, you're still here with me. I need you, Winkit. Now that Kayan's gone, she's already fixed one of my questions. I need you to be on it with me, Winkit. Next. Okay, so it's given you a transition metal complex, and it's asking us to check. Do you understand the term coordination number? One, two, three, four, five, six. Nice and easy. Six coordinate bonds to the nitrogen. Uh, to, sorry, to the nickel. Thank you so much for sacrificing your break for us. Oh, you're very welcome, Kayan. I see the value, and, and, I, and I love you guys to pieces, so I'm always willing to support, even in my holidays. So it's either six, and then what's the oxidation state of the overall compound, M? Well, it's told us that nickel is plus two, the chloride ion is minus one, the oxalate ions, which you've got to recognize there, guys, are, this is the oxalate ion, and they're minus two. Yeah, they're minus two, OX2 minus. So that's two of them, so minus two and minus two. That means total minus six, and nickel's a plus two, so it's going to be in a minus four. The answer is D. In acidic, condition, in acidic conditions, manganate seven ions are reduced to manganese two plus. In neutral conditions, manganate seven ions are reduced to manganese four oxide. A 22 centimeters cube solution of manganate seven ions were needed to oxidize 25% of iron two to iron three in atmospheric conditions. Okay, so it's given us this guy. The same solution of manganate was used to oxidize 25 as the same solution in neutral conditions. By considering the oxidation charges involved, it may be shown that the volume of manganate seven ion required in neutral conditions is. <sighs> Right, so we've got Mn plus 6 going to Mn plus 4. No, sorry, plus 2 in acidic. Now, that requires it to gain 4 electrons. The Mn6 plus, sorry, 7 plus. My, ah, that was easy. God, 5 electrons. So easily done. 5 electrons. Mn7 plus gains, uh, goes to Mn4 plus, yeah, which means it gains three electrons. The iron two plus, the iron two plus to iron three, no, iron, it's reduced, the iron three plus, no, iron two to three, mm -hmm, other way, 
ion 2 plus to ion 3 plus will gain one electron. So the ratio of this guy to this guy, it says in, this is this horrible question, in a 22 centimeters cubed, oxidize 25 in acidic, right? So in acidic, it's a ratio of five to one. Then it says to oxidize the same amount of that, that's a five to one, in neutral conditions, it's going in a three to one ratio. Now, if the 25, if that there is being oxidized 25, so yeah, so that's 25, and this was 22. Now, if this was 25 again, what would be the number here? So, what we do is, I guess, we work... Um, I don't want to have to go around the houses on this. So, the answer is it's going to be less. Agreed? Because it's going to be three-fifths. Three-fifths? Yeah, we've got three of the five. I'm going to require less of it because it will stop earlier. Kind of makes sense. So let's just do three-fifths of 25. 25 divided by five. Oh, no, that's not going to work, is it? Oh, no, sorry, 22. 22. Uh, three-fifths of 22. 22 divided by five times by three. 13.2. That's my answer. I'm not wasting any more time with that, guys. That one I'm curious about. That one's really lovely. I, I can break it down further if I need to and start looking at all the equations and make assumptions about concentration, and, but I don't want to. We have to assume that all the concentrations are the same. It seems reasonable for us to look at it like that. Let's do it like that. I'm very curious about that one. A solution contains 19.6 dm uh, grams per dm cubed of chromium three sulfate. What is the concentration in moles per dm cubed of the sulfate of the sulfate ions in the solution? Okay, so if you put the chromium, sorry, switch back to black. If you put chromium three sulfate into water, it's gonna dissolve to give two chromium three pluses plus twelve two. Yeah, sorry, I've written down the wrong formula. There we go. Two chromium three pluses plus a boatload of them. Three times four. Three times, no, 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 no. Just three of them. I'm an idiot. Not doing very well this morning. There we go. So I'm going to get three. So if I had this many grams per dm, in order to use an equation, you must be in moles. First thing I need to do, grams over rams. The dm hasn't changed. Oh, hang on. Grams per mole. Yeah, okay, so we've got that 90 in a litre, and they've got that many. Okay, so let's just do 19 grams over rams over 392. Just run it. 19.6 over 392. It's massive. It's 0.05 moles in a litre. Yeah, and it looks it's in DM cube there as well. Yeah, moles of this guy. Well, to get to the sulfate ion... The ratio once in the in the solution is a one to three. Multiply it by three, and I get 0.15 C. Moving on. The key there is understanding that when you put it into solution, it's going to it's going to ionize, it's going to fall apart. And recognizing that when it falls apart, you get those different numbers of ions based on the formula. Uh, it's the end of the multiple choice. Thank goodness, didn't like that. <laughs> I did say, paper five's hard, and I do not expect it to be easy, and I expect to make mistakes. Okay, nice bit of cells. Oh, God, it's early. It's like 10.45. It's early. How long has it taken me to do that? Uh-oh, learn more. Go away. I don't want that. How long has it taken me? 39 minutes. That's a bit longer than I wanted. In my unit four, it was taking me approximately 30. I have done a bit more teaching on that, and I had to go back to a question, but still, a bit long that. Okay, salt bridge is containing, right, what they use, it doesn't matter, potassium nitrate. Identify by name or formula. Potassium nitrate is your go-to salt bridge. The electrodes are going to be made of platinum, your go-to platinum. Now, just to point out that the platinum B, um, just to, the, the platinum is already done named for she, that's the she electrode, standard hydrogen electrode. Just to check that it's not iron, the solution is made of iron 2 and iron 3, so B does need to be platinum. This, if that had been 
if this had been iron metal, if this had just been FEF solid, then I would have done B as iron. But in this case, the cell is made of two, two ions, so therefore B needs to be platinum. Well, the solution containing one molar, one mole per dm cubed, Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. Seems reasonable to me. Half equation, iron 2 plus, in order to measure its standard electropotential, that's what it will need to be. Moving on, that was nice and easy, gaining some of my time back. The cell diagram for the electrochemical series, write the equations for the two half cells, hence to use the overall equation. Right, I always like cell, I, always, I like electrochemistry. So this is a reactant, this is a product, this is a reactant, this is a product. So equation number one is MN2 plus going to, you can even make it reversible since cells tend to be, but it doesn't actually matter, they won't care, going to MNO4 minus. Right, now we're going to moe that. Yeah, so one, so this is moe. Yeah, moe. Um, students, of course, of mine in my classes know this process. This is for balancing half equations. Metal, water for oxygen. There's four plus four H2Os. Right, tick. Acid, H plus. I need H plus here, and I'm going to need eight of them. And then I'm going to have to balance now for charge with my electrons. On this side, I've got plus two. On this side, I have minus one and plus eight. That's plus seven. So I'm going to have to add five electrons onto that side to bring it down. Next. So that's that one done. Next one, BiO3. Bismuth. BiO3 going to Bi3+. plus. Sorry, BiO3 minus. There we go. Right. Moe again. Let's run it again. Metal, bismuth, one and one. Water for oxygen, H2O, and I need three. Acids for hydrogens, plus six H pluses. Yeah, because I've got six of them here. Next, balance with the electrons for charge on this side, plus six and minus one, plus five. Bismuth on this side, it's the only one, plus three, zero, plus three. Right, bring it down, add two electrons. I've run off the page, that's a nightmare. In, now, that's actually a really good point. If I'd been in an exam, that would have been a total fiasco. I would have just tucked it in there. That's what I would have done. Yeah. Was it two? That was plus five, and that was plus three. Bring it down with two. Right. Now I need to put them together. Now I need to put them together, and the electrons need to cancel. So I need to multiply both equations by two, because that means the electrons are going to cancel. Yeah, the electrons are going to cancel. So now, now the, can I just point out, in an exam, this is a bit of a nightmare, because having to rewrite everything takes so much time. Um, what I would recommend, really, is... Because you now do multiply by 2, multiply by 5. They, they will allow you, of course, to have multiples in your actual equations. That's totally fine. So that's going to be 8. That's going to be 2, 2. 16 and 10. Yeah, multiply by 5. Multiply by 5. Ugh, 6 times 5 is 30. 5, 10, 5. See, it's becoming really messy. It's a bit of a nightmare, that. Now you need to cancel out everybody. So what I would do is, guys, I would write the original, the original equations in pen. Then I would switch to pencil for adjusting all the numbers and doing all the various cancellations. I'd switch to pencil and then you can just erase it. That's how I would do this in an exam. So the electrons now disappear. I'm going to choose a different color for this because I'm doing this. In. The electrons now vanish. Right, the H pluses mostly vanish. Third, all 16 of them disappear over there. That leaves me with 14 over here. Yeah, 30 and 8, 16, yeah. And then the waters all vanish from this side, and that means 8, so that means brings me down to 7, and I'm finished. Now I'm going to write my full equation. 14 H pluses, water's gone, plus 5 BiO3 minuses, plus 2 MN2 pluses, goes to 2 MnO4 minuses, plus 5 Bi3 pluses, plus seven H2Os, and it should now, at that point, I now erase 
all of my adjustments, all of my bits in pencil that I would do. So what I would now do is I would go back to through 15, yeah, back to three, back to three, back to one, back to two, back to two, back to one, back to six. And then I'd go back to four, back to two, back to two, back to eight, and then back to five, just like that. That's how I would have done it in my exam, just so you know, and get rid of all of these. Yeah, don't need any of it. So I'm now going to check this. 14 H's, 14 H's, 5 BI's, 5 BI's, 15 oxygens, 8, 15 oxygens, 2 manganese, 2 manganese. Let me atoms add up. Let's check my charges. If that, if that adds up the charge as well. So that's plus 14. I'm probably doing this for fun, by the way, now, guys. Plus 4. Total on that side. Ugh. Minus, uh, minus 15? No, no. 18. Is that plus 13? Don't like it. Yeah, plus 13. And then we get minus 2 and then plus 15, which gives me plus 13. It all adds up. All adds up. Nice. There you go. Four marks. State symbols are not required. Write the overall. That's uh, three marks. Moving on. That's grim. Ugh. Right. So, guys, there is a whole load of other equations in chemistry. And if you go on to do a degree in chem, you're going to be battered by these. But essentially, it's just a maths game. It's inserting numbers. They've given you this disgusting electrode equation. And they're asking you to put everybody into it. So the E standard value is over here. So that goes into, and what's it asking me to calculate? Calculate the new electrode potential. So that there is minus 0 0.74, 8.31. Temperature, 298. Oh, thank you, Angel. N is the number of electrons in the half equation, which is three. And then LN, the the, the, the new concentration, that guy, 0 0.01. Right. Okay. Run it through your process. So now I would do this, two marks. I would do this in, I would actually write that out with minus, no, I would write it out with all my numbers subbed in, 8.31 times by 298. That's going to be a mark, by the way, guys, the subbing in. That's what they do with this. If they give you funky equations, there is a mark for subbing in, just simply showing all the subbed in numbers. There we go. Right. Now I'm going to do this bit by bit. I'm going to work out this disgusting thing first. So for me, because my math skills are poor, 7, 4 plus, I'm going to work out this horrible piece. 8.31 multiplied by 298 equals... Divide that by open brackets, nine, six, five hundred times three, close brackets. So that now gives me plus, it is plus, isn't it? Yeah. 8.55 times 10 to the minus three. M oh, oh, it's not an equals. I'm an idiot. That's how easy it is to make a mistake. Times, times ln 0 0.01. Right. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to type that in exactly into my account. I'm actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to do these two first. So minus 0 0.74, oh, hang on a minute, don't like that. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to do those two first. I'm going to do this one first. Yeah, bid mass, bod mass, brackets, indices, divide, multiply, add, subtract. So that's an add, so I'm going to do that after. going to do the multiply first, 8.55 exponential. Have I got like a number on my, no, no, no. Answer equals. I don't have got that answer on the calculator. Multiplied by ln. Oh, I'm going to put it in a bracket. Multiplied by brackets. Ln 0 0.01. Close brackets. Okay. I now get minus 0 0.0394. Okay. I'm now going to do that final bit of minus 0 0.74 plus brackets that value. So minus minus 0 0.74. Plus brackets minus 0.0394. And I get an answer of minus 
nine. And the it's gonna be in volts. So it's gone up. No, it hasn't, it's gone down. <laughs> Next, done. That was an awful lot of work for two marks. <clears throat> Remember though, I always say to students, like, never rush a paper. Like, I'm taking my time here. I'm not really feeling overly panicked. I'm having a chat with you halfway through a paper. Which I probably shouldn't be doing the same as the time. But I'm doing it because I want you to recognize that even though that one's taken me a bit longer than it probably should have, should have like, I don't mind because there are always going to be questions like that, three marks. That's a nightmare. That sucked up my time, that did. But there were also questions like those three, which was like, I just spat them out. Like, that was easy. Save myself. There's always going to be questions that take time and questions that don't. This one's not going to, is it? So this one's given us a mechanism, which is total garbage, step one. And it's given us this series of images, which are all garbage. Describe the three changes to correct the mechanism. Okay, number one, the curly arrow there is incorrect. It's going in the wrong direction. So I'm actually going to just draw the correct one. Yeah, that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to literally draw the correct one. Put the charge where it should be, and it's going to do that. Done. Uh, it says describe, so I'm going to put um, curly arrow, curly arrow needs to leave, needs to leave from, from BZ ring. I'd like benzene in my exam, by the way. Just saving myself a bit of time here. Right, the next picture is also garbage. The ring is all kinds of messed up. So they've attached the NO2 to here and the H to here. There's two mistakes now. The first mistake is that the curly arrow should be going from there inwards. Yeah, instead of leaving from the hydrogen, that's garbage. The next thing is that the ring is broken incorrectly as well. So the ring should have been facing that corner post. Now, this, what that means is that there are two thing, two mistakes here, and I need to pick one. Yeah? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw their original image, and I'm going to put curly arrow, curly arrow should start from bond, should start from, from bond. Yeah? But I've drawn the correct bit. That's the correction. Yeah? Then I'm going to redraw that same thing again, but this time I'm going to be showing that the ring should be facing the, the correct carbon atom. Yeah, the correction there is that the, that needs to face this carbon here. So broken ring, broken ring, I'll write it in black, broken ring, broken ring should face the carbon with attachments with NO2 attached. That's what I would do. That would be a very interesting one to see exactly what they wanted. Can I just point out, I'm gonna get all the marks just for the diagrams, just so you know, but still. Give the reagents for step two. Uh, reagents, what? Reagents for step two. Oh, that's clever. I was looking, I was looking at the bit, it's actually this step too. Nitrobenzene to phenylamine, tin and HCl. You've just got to know your transformations, folks. Tin and HCl, aqueous. Done. Phenylamine is a base. Explain why phenylamine is a weaker base than ammonia. Okay, so just to explain here that phenylamine, yeah, this is, this is the picture of phenylamine. Yeah, and now people are probably wondering why I'm drawing it as this. And then they're comparing this to ether, to ammonia. Okay, this is the picture of ammonia. I'm hoping that you'd realize that I'm drawing this as, as trigonal pyramidal. Yeah, now what's happening here is you would expect phenyl, by the way, pH of ammonia, you have to know, it's pH 11. Yeah, and you'd expect this to be a higher pH because it's a, it is technically a primary amine. However, the pH of phenylamine is about eight. The reason being is the lone pair on the nitrogen is sucked into the delocalized ring of electrons. Yeah, so benzene has this delocalized system, this delocalized pi system like this, yeah, of these p orbitals. And the p orbital gets drawn in, yeah? And so it, it means that the lone pair is less available. 
And it's all whenever you talk about amines and their basicity, it's all about the availability of the lone pairs. So in this case, what we're going to state is lone pair, lone pair on nitrogen is incorporated, incorporated into the benzene ring. The benzene ring. Therefore, therefore, the availability, availability, be, availability, the availability of the lone pair, of the lone pair is reduced. So it can't, it, it, as a base wise, it's accepting H plus. So won't accept H plus as readily. Remember that basicity is about the idea of picking up H plus. Yeah. So this is what's happening. That's the measure of how well it can collect that H plus. Yes. And the fact is that this one is far less available. Yeah, because it's been drawn into this system. So it's just so this one's going to be able to reach out far better than that one will. I hope that makes sense, guys. Um, three marks seems very reasonable. Going to move on. State what is seen when a few drops of aqueous solution of phenylamine is added to copper 2 plus in solution. So this is now dropped back into transition metals and the reaction. This is aqueous transition metals. So just to tell you that. Phenylamine is a base. It's a bad base, but it is a base. And what's going to happen is if you've got hexa aqua, remember, all transition metals in solution are hexa aqua. And if we add phenylamine, which is NH2 benzene, C6H5, What's going to happen is it's going to primarily act as a base, even though it's a bad one. Yeah, it's going to act as a base and it's going to remove the protons and form the tetraaqua dihydroxy complex, which is a blue precipitate. Yeah, and then I'm going to form, I'm going to need two of those. Yeah, and then I'm going to form, you know, this guy, three plus. Should put the plus on the nitrogen where it belongs. Yeah, there we go. Nice. Nice. Um, next. So what will be seen? A blue precipitate. I'm going to put PPT. Moving on. Okay, azo dyes. Now, azo dyes are fairly bespoke, I believe, to Edexcel, but I might be wrong. I think maybe Cambridge has it. AQA certainly don't. Um, anyway, azo dyes. Give the reagents and conditions for step number one. So we're forming the the um, as, as azonium ion. Yeah. So in this case, what we now need to do is to get that nitrogen to do that. We need to add a compound with a nitrogen in it. And then we also need to add an acid to give it that Cl minus. Now, this is a rather unusual. This is sodium nitrite. They would also accept nitrous acid as well. But then we also add, of course, and, and HCl, aqueous. Um, yeah. Okay, so night. So it's either all of these guys, by the way, either or. Um, deduce the structure of the organic compound. By the way, oh, also to tell you, ah, I'm about to miss it. Condition. Oh, five degrees Celsius. Five degrees C. So easy. I gave the reagents. These are my reagents. And I didn't follow it up with the condition. It needs to be. So common question as well here, guys. Bit of teaching again. Is that the ozonium ion. Um, the ozonium ion is, is very unstable. And you have to keep this at five degrees Celsius. Otherwise, it will simply decompose. It'll break down. And you won't get your finos final stable azo dye at the end of it. It'll just break apart. Um, so we have to keep it at a cold temperature, and you just have to know it's five degrees. Yeah. Did you, by the way, that question comes up. Explain why it needs to be done at five degrees Celsius. And you say, because the azonium ion will decompose. 
Is it called a diazone, do you mind? I'm just going to check that. Uh, azonium ion. Diazonium ion. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Diazonium ion. This is called the diazonium ion. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted. So now what we need to do is deduce the structure of the organic compound needed to produce azovilid in step number two. So here's this bit, here's that bit. You can see that it's that's still the same. So what we've added is ooh, uh, three hydroxyphenol, ooh, or one three dihydroxybenzene. So can I just also point out, by the way, guys, that this there's another common extension of this question. So you need to have this. This is the compound they want in their mark scheme, I'm assuming. There you go. But just to also tell you that you also need the second reagent is that you must have sodium hydroxide here, aqueous. The reason being is, in reality, you realize what we're trying to do is we've got a positive structure here at the end, and we want to attach on somebody. Now, in order to get that into it, we need it to be negative. So when we do sodium hydroxide, it actually turns it into this. Now, students often ask them at this point, why does it not link on to those oxygens? Eh, that's really complicated because the electrons become delocalized into the pi system. That's why. So it activates the benzene ring. That's what it's doing, just so you know. So I'm going to put the, the diol. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't call that a diol, by the way. I would call that, I'd love to know the, the proper name for that. Um, I'd say 1,3-dihydroxybenzene or 3-hydroxyphenol. That seems weird, right? You can't have phen diol. Okay. Anyway, uh, you don't need this guy for this question. Give a reason why azovalid exists as geometrical isomers. Because there is a nitrogen double bond which cannot rotate. We know that ge geometrical isomerism, geometrical isomerism is usually in the C double bond setting. Yeah, X, Y, Z, and W. And that these can be, the, the double bond can't rotate. I'm going to say nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen double bond. Nitrogen double bond. Double bond has restricted rotation. Has restricted Rotation. Yeah, you can't rotate it. I just put, I shouldn't put restrict, I should just put can't. Can't rotate. Yeah. So it's going to show geometrical. That's really lovely, that. What a beautiful extension for you to pick up. Because if you'd forgotten what geometrical isomerism was from AS chemistry, then you read stuck. Yeah, so that's a genius. I love that question. Okay, next one. Oh, draw the optical isomer. So just reverse it. Do the exact mirror image. Not going to waste your time on that. C. H two C six H five H N H two. Do the exact mirror image. Yeah, done. Moving on, moving on. This question is about an organic compound. Uh, I remember this question. Right. This question's hard. It's stupid hard when it's stupid easy. It's such a ridiculous question. This question is about some organic compounds. A mixture of methane and ethane with a total volume of 25 requires 65 centimeters cubed of oxygen for complete combustion. All gas volumes were measured at the same temperature and pressure. Determine the percentage by volume of methane and ethane in the mixture, or just in this case, methane. So they're saying that we've got a balloon with a mixture of methane and ethane in it. Yeah, now the great thing is that, or any gas uh, at a fixed temperature occupies the same volume. So we've got a mixture there and we're going to burn each of them completely. So let's balance each equation. Plus O2 goes to CO2 and water. Balance the equation. One carbon, one carbon, four hydrogens, four hydrogens, uh, two oxygens, four oxygens, two. Right. Next, so ethane plus oxygen goes to CO2 and water. Balance the equation. C2, C2, H6, H6. Let's do them in red. I prefer the numbers because it's actually all about these numbers. 
So three and then two. Right, oxygens wise, four, seven, 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 seven divided by two is 3.5. So four plus seven. Yeah, okay, right. So now that I've got that, what it's done is it's told me it has a mixture of the fuels, a mixture of the fuels, and that for complete combustion, it required oxygen of 65 centimeters. Well, the first thing is you need to get to moles. To be able to use equations, we need to get to moles. Now, we can't work out the moles of fuel because the reason being is the 25 centimeters cubed is a mix. However, what we can do is work out the moles of oxygen. So the moles of oxygen is 65 centimeters cubed over 24,000, the ideal gas constant, because it's at a fixed temperature and pressure. Let's use that. It's only four marks. You could use PV because then our TV is going to go nuts. Right, so 65 divided by 24,000 is going to give me, right, so that gives me the moles of oxygen as 2.71 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of oxygen, moles of oxygen. Now, the next thing is, because we can work out the moles of fuel, in fact, because the all, we not you notice, guys, we ha didn't have an MR here, and that all gases occupy the same volume at a given temperature and pressure, so the fuels being in a mix doesn't really matter. I can work out the moles of get fuel based on the volume of gas I was given. So I can do that. So my previous statement was wrong. 25 divided by 24,000. It will give me the moles. 0 point, sorry, 1.04 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Right, now here's the genius bit. What's the ratio of the... Because what we realize is that the, ratio, the amount of oxygen needed for methane is 2 for 1 mole. The amount of oxygen needed for ethane is 3.5. Well, if we have a mixture then we're going to end up with a number of, of the ratio of oxygen being somewhere between 2 and 3.5. So what we need to do is we need to work out what the ratio is. So divide them all by the smallest will get me into the ratio. One for fuel, and notice, one for fuel. Yeah, both equations here have the number one in front of them. One of the fuel... Now, if I divide that by 0 0.4 times 10 to 1.04 times 10 to the minus 3, 2.71 exponential minus 3 divided by answer, exponential minus 3 divided by answer equals 2.6. Right. So my equation is my actual ratio is 2.6. So I've got methane, which needed 2 moles of oxygen and ethane which required 3.5 moles of oxygen and i've just worked out 2.6 was the actual number so what we can now do is we can work out how so by the way please note first thing to notice here guys 2.6 is closer to methane's number than it is to ethane's number so how do we now work out the, the actual ratio? What we now do is that if, if methane, methane was 2 and ethane, whoops, ethane was 3.5, our number was 2.6. 2.6. Right. We are closer to 2 than we are to 3.5. What that means is there is more, this is the methane, and this is the ethane. There is more methane than there is ethane. So the difference between these two is 1.5. Yeah? Now, the difference, since this is the methane, and because we've got more methane than ethane, yeah? The difference between 2.6 and 3.5 is 0.9. So 0.9 over the total difference, 0 0.9 over 1.5 gives, times 100, we want it as a percentage, gives me 60%.
So it is 60% methane, 40% ethane. I hope that made sense. That there is a horrible question. In my opinion, just disgusting. Requires some really lateral thinking. Um, you can do that purely mathematically, by the way. I don't do it mathematically because I work in chemistry speak. Um, however, my really good mathematicians, they too have no doubt will be able to solve that algebraically. There is an algebraic method, but I'm not even going to attempt it. Not even going to attempt it. Someone else can do that on my webinar if they like. Okay, devise a reaction scheme to convert, this is now synthesis, to convert butantuol into one amino two methyl butantuol in three steps. Okay, so key to synthesis is knowing how to get to each person and recognize families. This is a, this is a hydroxyamine. Well, that will have come from a hydroxynitrile. So what we're going to do here, and this is, I know this is horrible. Often it's sometimes it's easier to go backwards through synthesis than anything else. So that there would have been created from a hydroxynitrile. Yeah, that there, like that. Make sure that this is very clear. I'll just do all my bonds there. Uh, I'm not going to waste my time with hydrons, even though I would in my real exam. Oh, I would. No, I will. It doesn't add enough extension to my webinar that I should be bothered, and it shouldn't add enough time to your things that you shouldn't do it either. Right. So to get from here to here is going to be reduction with LiAlH4 or, or nickel and hydrogen gas, uh, either one, 60 degrees. Now, to get to this guy, we need a, you need a ketone. Yeah, so this is going to have come from butanone. Yeah, there's butanone. Add on your H's. So to do this one, and by the way, if you do LiAlH4, it must be in dry ether. Can't forget that because it reacts with water if you're interested. Yeah, so this is going to be butanone going to this guy. To get the butanone up to the hydroxynitrile, we're going to use potassium cyanide and HCN. That's what we're going to do. And that'll be a heat under reflux. Heat reflux. Uh, yeah. Next, how do you now get to the ketone from the butanol? That's going to be um, oxidation. Include any equations for oxidation or reduction. Oh, no. So that's going to come from the butanol. Uh, yeah, it's clever that you add, had to add in the carbon, carbon, you see. There's no other way around that. To go from there is acidified potassium dichromate. This is K2Cr2O7 in the presence of dilute sulfuric acid. There you go. Right, it now wants me to write equations for each of these steps. Um, students often ask me, how do you know how to do this? It comes with practice. You need to practice synthesis. You just do. After a while, you see common patterns, and you just have to keep practicing it. I'll do as many as I can on these webinars, but it just takes practice. They now want all the equations for any reduction in oxidations. So CH3, CH2, CH brackets, OH, there's butan, 2 all being oxidized in the presence of Potassium dichromate, I'm going to form butanone, which is this guy, plus water. Run out of space in the exam, I wouldn't, of course, but run out of space there. And that actually adds up just like that. <clears throat> and then, any, any equations for the reduction? That's a reduction. The lithium tetrahydrido aluminate is a reduction. So that's going to be CH3, CH2, CH... Oh, got to be careful here. Um, no, then brackets OH, brackets CN, CN, CH3. That's my, my I'm going to change that because it looks like an A. There you go. Right, reduce it with H in a bracket. You're going to need loads of them to form CH3, CH2. I'm building it in my head here. Um then it becomes the amine, which is now the longest, which is now going to be taking preferential treatment. So it now becomes, uh, if you're wondering how to do that bit there, CH3, CH2, that's this section. This C now 
you gain the still have the OH bracket. There's no H, which means the OH goes first. Then I'm going down to this guy, CH. Oh, oh, and I now need another bracket branch for this bit. Yeah, so CH3 bracket branch and then CH2 NH2. There you go. It's grim that. It's hard. You can draw it out. They'd let you draw all of that out, you know. They really would. Lots of students really hate those kind of equations. And so I'm now going to do C brackets, OH, close brackets, brackets, CH3, then CH2, NH2. And then I need to balance with the number of hydrogens I need. Oh, so looking at the diagram, looking at the diagram up here. Yeah, the OH hasn't changed, but the I've gained four here. So that's going to be four there. And there's no other byproduct, so I'm good. Horrible that. Really grim, guys. Hard. By the way, please do not ever write an equation that disappears off down the line. Just learn to shrink your writing. My right, This isn't the same for me, of course, because I'm writing on my tablet. What I should have done is zoomed right in there, and it would have fit. Yeah, I'm hoping you get that. Moving on. Okay. Um, uh, this question is about transition metals and their compounds. Iron 3 plus yellow in solution. That's a yellow solution right there. So we're now going to form the brown precipitate. The ammonia is acting as a base. Fe, can I zoom in? Fe, this is going to be triaqua trihydroxy. Yeah, you're going to remove, going to remove three protons and form our precipitate, our brown precipitate. And I'm going to form ammonium plus. There's going to be three of these and three of these, and it all adds up a charge and whatnot. State the type of reaction occurring in reaction number two. Reaction. That's weird. Oh, I've just flipped back a page. It's lucky I recognized that. So this one now, I've gone six waters to five waters and swapping on ew, a thiocyanide ion. Eek. Thiocyanate? Um, yeah, thiocyanide, which is uh, it's a ligand substitution. A ligand substitution. If you're interested that the role in that in this reaction here the role of the ammonia is a base because it's stealing a h plus in this one its role is now a lewis a lewis base that's what it is this is a bronsted lowry base and that one there's a lewis base complete the diagram for the structure of reaction three um oh it's the diamine it's ethyl diamine e yeah ethyl ethan one two diamine um okay draw it so the diamine nitrogen 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 c c link c c link c c link H's, one, two, 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 and H, 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 that looks like something else, and H, 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 what? a freaking nightmare oh gotta be careful because this is it was fe3 plus at the core and each of those are two are oh neutral ligands plus please guys you have no choice but to do that i know it's it's a nightmare and everyone's like well can i just do this as formulae you'll make mistakes just show the sticks take your time what time am i on now i mean i'm curious to know just because i'm now up to one hour 20 minutes so it'll be interesting to see how far off I'm. I don't even know if I'm in section C yet. I don't think I am, am I? I'm not even on section C yet. It's going to be a long paper. Paper five's hard. Okay, right. Colors for vanadium. God, just give the color. You just got to know your colors. Right. So yellow, yellow, green, blue, green, violet. So yellow, green. Nope, 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 nope. It's a fake green. It's a mixture. Blue, green, I love that they put mauve just to throw everyone off. It's violet. Moving on. 
uh, two vanadium species exist in equilibrium in an aqueous solution. Deduce whether or not this is a redox reaction, justify your answer. Same process that we had before. So this is going to be minus six, so plus five for vanadium. Yeah, it looks like a four that. I'm gonna shrink down my pen here at this point. So that's minus six, but minus there, so vanadium's in a plus five. And then vanadium over here, we've got minus four, and it's in a plus one, so therefore must still be plus five. So this is not redox. Not redox. Not redox. Due to no changes in oxidation state. Nice and easy. Let's move on. V plus five. Nice. Next. Okay, chemical cells predict the oxidizing agent that would convert vanadium 2 into vanadium 3 and then into vanadium 4, but not vanadium 5 under standard conditions. Use, only use the data from the tables, include equations and E-cell values for the two reactions. Right, so we want to turn that to that, so flip the more negative. We need this to be the more negative because the equation is backwards. If this was forwards, then we'd have to make it more positive. We'd have to flip it over, but we don't. So two plus to three plus, then three plus to four plus, and then not run that one. More neg. Right, now I need to pick a reagent that allows this. So if I use copper two plus, then that would, that is more positive and that is more negative. That will drive that one, yes. But it won't drive that one. Because that one's now more positive. Copper two plus is out of the window. No. Right, the nitrate ion, so it's going to be something like nitric acid. Yeah, so nitric acid plus that one's going to drive that one. Yes, it will drive that one. Yes, but it won't drive that one. There's my choice. If I use bromine, I'm going to do that one as well, which is not what I want. So it's nitrate ion. So we now need to include, <laughs> include equations and ESL values. Oh, that's so grim. How many marks? Five. Five minutes. 11.28, I'm curious about one in the times now. Okay, so at that point, just rubbing all this off, just so I've now explained myself and my choice. So this guy is what I'm, I'm gonna do this one first. So we we'll flip the more negative. So this will become V2 plus going to V3 plus plus an electron. And this has one electron, so they just cancel out. So my equation will be MO3 minus plus V2 plus goes, uh, and two H pluses goes to, because the electrons cancel and I flip the other equation, goes to V3 plus plus uh, H2, uh, plus these guys, NO2 plus H2O. Now the, that's the equation. The voltage that would provide us here is the difference between those two voltages, yeah, which is going to be 1.06. If you want me to do the number line, I can. Yeah, so we know that electrons always flow in the same directions that chemical reactions do. The more positive one is plus 0 0.8. The negative one is minus 0 0.26. So that's zero there. That turn that into a positive and add it on. So the diff, the total difference between the two. So the the E cell voltage is is just yeah. Anyway. Uh, becomes the e, e cell, I'll put E cell equals 1.06 volts. Okay, E cell, here we go. Okay, next next reaction. Um, next reaction is going to be the same equation here, but with the next one. It needs to be reversed, but still only one electron, which is nice. So this one, I haven't got the space. I, add, actually, I do actually, V3 plus plus water goes to VO2 plus plus two. If anybody's wondering why I'm doing that, the reason why I'm doing this is because it stops me making mistakes. So I'm now gonna just have these guys flip the more negative. So that becomes V3 plus plus H2O. Now add on all these parts, plus NO2, NO3 minus plus two H pluses uh, goes to, yeah, electrons disappear. Go to VO2 plus plus. Oh, the two H pluses are about to disappear. Isn't that clever? H pluses are about to vanish. That's in, that's in, that's neat, isn't it? So the H pluses cancel out on those two equations. So that's good. It just disappears. Yeah. And then I'm going to form plus the water cancels out as well. 
Ha! The water vanishes as well. Isn't that entertaining? I'm done. It's just that. Should all add up. It does, amazingly. Yeah. All adds up. And the e, e cell for that one, the E cell for that one is going to be the difference between him and him, which is smaller. So 0 0.8, calculate along 0 0.8 minus 0 0.34 gives me 0 0.46, 0 0.46 volts. Do I need to explain anything? Predict the oxidizing agent. So I've got four marks guaranteed here, and my oxidizing agent, oxy agent, oxidizing agent, uh, I'm going to say nitric acid, HNO3, nitric acid, because it'll provide me with the nitrate ion. Yeah, could have probably chosen sodium nitrate as well. Probably totally reasonable. Let's move on. Transition metal compounds, transition metals, uh, their compounds and their ions can act as heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysts. Compa compare and contrast these two types of catalytic behavior. Include one specific example from transition metal chemistry of each of these types of catalysis and a reaction in which it is used. Okay. So, um, compare and contrast. Okay, so both, let's first of all talk about why they're done. They're done to speed up rate and they provide an alternative route of reaction. So both, both types increase, both types increase rate of reaction rate of reactions by providing by providing an alternative an alternative route of reaction with a with a lower activation energy with a I cannot stress that GCSE but lower activation energy Okay, now, now we've said that they both do that. Now we need to compare their processes. So heterogeneous, heterogeneous catalysts, cats, I'm gonna put cats, I'm not, there's no point. Heterogeneous catalysts are in a different phase, or in a different phase, phase compared compared to reactants compared to reactants for example for example iron metal in Haber process give an equation uh, do I need to do anything else just mm, can I include one specific example each and the reaction in which it's used, Haber process, uh, I'm actually then gonna go N2 plus H2 goes to ammonia and balance. I know this is ridiculous, but it fits just about, there we go. Haber, now I'm gonna say how it works. Um, hang on, do I need to do that? Different phase. Yeah, now I'm gonna say how it wor works, so uh, reactants, reactants adsorb, that's important, adsorb to active sites, to active sites on catalyst bonds, bonds are weakened, weakened stroke broken new products made new product made and desorbs full stop so there's my hetero done now i need to do homo so homogeneous cats catalysts are in the same phase in the same phase as reactants, as reactants, same phase as reactants. Mr. Duncan, I have to go, but we'll do the paper later. Thank you. Thanks so much. I love the fact that 
you guys are disappearing and I'm the one staying. Like, I'm not entirely sure how that works out, but... But you are being super nice to say thank you. Homogeneous cats, different phase reactions, for example. Now, we have to pick a transition metal one here, which is tricky, this. For homogeneous, it's going to be iron 2, for example. Iron 2 plus. Or we could have gone for cobalt. Um, 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 um. Iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus in the reaction. And yes, you have to name both. Yeah, and iron 3 plus in the reaction. In the reaction between... Uh, iodine and, and iodine, iod, potassium iodide, iodide ions, and the, it's, I can give the equation, can't name it, stupid, like peroxodisulfite ion or something, peroxodisulfate, S2O8, two minus ions, between I minus ions and the S2 phyllo minus ions. Um, now I need to say how it works. Yeah, so... <sighs> change in oxidation states. <sighs> Give the equations for it. Fe2 plus reacts with... I don't want to go to town on this. Uh, this is... this No, a homogeneous catalysis is hard. And um, it's six marks, and I really don't... I've definitely got at least five of them. I can just state um, iron, Fe ions can be, can be both oxidized and reduced, oxidized and reduced, and reduced. Oh, cat box, fine. I'm going to just explain to you how I do this so I can access my knob. Uh, I was going to do the paper in the afternoon. It's probably best to do it alone first so I can assess my knowledge. Assess my knowledge. Okay. So just to explain cat boxes, I designed this method. So the iodide ion reacts with the S2O8 2 minus ion to form iodine and sulfate ions. Two of them and two of those. Right, that reaction is crazy slow. It's crazy slow because both of the reactants are negative, both ions negative so they repel each other so what you now do is you add the transition metal in the form of iron 2 and iron 3 either one it doesn't matter but you quote both when you're doing it because they are both the catalyst for the process yeah let me explain now what happens is the iron 3 plus can gain an electron to form iron 2 plus and then the iron 2 plus can give away an electron to form iron 3 plus I call this here the cat box, because it says the two equations that the transition metal can do. Now you need to identify the two equations in this reaction. So the first one is that the iodide is going to form iodine and spit out two electrons. That one there is going to, that's going to give us electrons, which means it's going to go with the equation in the cat box that gains the electrons, which is him. Then you've got the second reaction, which is the S2O8 2 minus sign going to form two SO4 2 minus signs. Balance the equation. This is a two minus charge and this is a four minus charge. It's going to gain electrons, two electrons on that side. Now that one has two electrons going in, which means we need the equation in the cat box that has two electrons coming out, which is this guy. Now both of my, my reactions and the equations here require in here require on, or provide two electrons. The cat box only gives me one, so I need to double all my reaction equations in the cat box by two. Now I can combine the necessary equations to produce the overall one, which is going to be in my answer. So I'm going to have so the iron three plus so my equations will now be two iron three pluses are going to react with two iodides to form one iodine plus two Fe2 pluses. Then we're going to have two Fe2 pluses reacting with one S2O8 two minus ion to form two SO4 two minus ions plus two Fe3 
three pluses, and that's why it's a catalyst, and it should all add up, and I believe it does. Yeah, what's up? Good, 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 good. I'm moving on now at that point. What a nightmare. Section C. Oh. How am I doing on time-wise? It's hard, this, guys. It's tough. One hour 35, and I'm finding it tough. The Lanthanides. Ooh! Okay, that's quite exciting. Never seen it, guys. I have never, ever seen them ask about the Lanthanides. They're, they're horrible. So I'm not even going to bother reading all of it. I'll come back to that when I need it. Write an equation for the reduction of holmium 3 fluoride by calcium. That's clever, that. HOF3 plus calcium goes to HO. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. Oh, oh I'm making a HO. Um, now I need to balance it. 3 fluorine to common denominator 6. Yeah, okay. Uh, next one. Uh, students are going to ask me here at this point, how do you know to make ho? Uh, how, how do you know that that's just one? Well, the reduction of it means to bring it down from its oxidation state of a plus three here down. Well, if you're adding calcium metal, you, you can't just randomly pick a charge. You can't just go, like, oh, I'm going to make a whole holmium two plus. Like, it's just going to take it down to zero. This is metal extraction. Metal extraction got deleted by Edexcel, and that's where it is. Um, so yeah, though, so uh, two holmiums, two holmiums, uh, six fluorines, six fluorines, three calciums, three calciums. State symbols are not required. The electronic configuration of xenon. Okay, suggest a reason why gadolinium has the electronic configuration of this rather than this. Right. So the 5D is not there, and it has ended up in the 4F. Oh, okay. I can see exactly what they're doing here. So in AS, if you remember in AS, you come across chromium and copper. Now, chromium and copper are weirdos, because if you run chromium, it would be 1s2, 2s2. By the way, I'm doing this in my head, just so you know. 1s2, back to the beginning, 2s2, skip across, 2p6, back to the beginning, 3s2, skip over, 3p6, back to the beginning, 4s2, 3d4. That would be the expected one for, for chromium. Look, one, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. 3p6, 4s2, 3d4. That's what it's expected. However, that is not what happens. You get promotion. Yep, the 4s2 promotes up. So you actually end up with 4s1, 3d5. Now, the reason for this is half full stability. We had one electron living in two electrons in the 4s. And then in the 3d, which is massive, yeah, you had this scenario for, for, for chromium. And what it realizes, two electrons in that orbital could actually be made less repulsive if, by the way, the 4s, by the way, are further out. Sorry, I do apologize. Yeah, and it hops up to get half full, so there's now no longer a repulsion between two electrons in an orbital. It's called half full stability. Now, what makes this really horrible is that the, the, the F block which I, I do teach, but I don't teach very often. I teach at the beginning of the year at AS, and then I never mention it again, which is two in the S, six in the P, 10 in the D, and 14 in the F. Now, 14 in the F, is it 14? F 14? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Right. Oh, okay. Ha, ha That's clever. Suggest a reason why gadolinium has the electronic configuration of this rather than this. Notice it's the F. So what has happened here is that one of the Fs has been promoted up to the 5D. 
The reason being is it gains half full stabili stability. Because four F8 is now, half full stability for a 14 block is seven. That's stupid hard. You guys never play around with the with the, the F block because it's it's just never done. This is the first time I've ever seen this. So the reason being, suggest a reason. Um, when, when Z, X, E, 4, F, 7, 5, D, 1, 6, S, 2, the 4, F is, the 4, F subshell, subshell is half full, is half full, brackets, half full stability. Done. Moving on. Give the electron configuration of samarium 3 plus. Holy moly. Where am I? Right, now they're doing all kinds of games here, folks. They were doing all kinds of games. There's samarium. So, samarium 3 plus. What we need to find is they're going to have given examples. There's samarium. Yeah, there's samarium. So three plus, oh man, really, 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 oh man. So xenon, oh man, it's not nice this. Sumerium, how does that compare to that xenon one? This is where I'm flicking backwards and xenon is 4F6, 6S2, 4F6. 4F6, 4F6, 6S2. Right, I'm going so hang on a minute. Let's just make an assumption. I, I'm not gonna start, that, I can do this much more detail, but I don't want to. That's what they've given us at the top, so let's use it. So what we're gonna do is, first of all, we're going to lose those 6Fs, those, sorry, the 6S. It's the furthest out. Both of those are gonna disappear. And then we're gonna lose one of the 4F. But the question is, where's the five gone? They're writing it all kinds of strange. I don't like it. Why is the form, why is that 6S2? Oh, it hasn't started filling it yet. Yeah, okay, that's fine, guys. It is good, just take, take run your normal process. Run your normal one. 4F5, done, that's it. Just take away three from it. The original was 4F6, six, six. 6s2 remove the first two from the largest numbers and then one from there we're done three plus i'm done let's not overthink it explain why the ionic radius of the thulium ion is less than that of the therium ion Th thulium and cerium cerium thulium it's got more protons way more Cerium has 58 protons, and thulium has 69 protons. I'm not going to overthink this. Uh, they're both got the same ion. Thulium, ugh. Thulium has, gets given number. Yeah, uh, that's, got no, that's got 69, 50, 11 more protons. Yeah, thulium has 11 more protons. Protons than cerium so electrons so outer electrons outer electrons have a greater attraction have a greater attraction to the nucleus attraction to nucleus i think that's very reasonable how am i getting on for time it seems to have gone on for a very long time one hour 44 nowhere near finished i don't believe okay two marks fine suggest a reason why the complex ion of the lanthanides can contain more ligands than those of the transition metals they're larger we know yeah look at that look at those numbers that we know that the reason why you can get six ligands around a transition metal ion is based on the size um so the lanthanides, lanthanide, lanthanide ions are larger, are larger than transition metal. 
position metal. Right. More waters can fit. Explain why solutions containing are colorless. <laughs> Most of the complexes formed are colored. This color is called by FF transitions. Okay, so they're linking this. This is really grim, guys. So the reason why transition metals have colors is because when they form a complex with water, you have a split D subshell. The D subshell, which was previously five hoxes, suddenly, when it becomes uh, bound to ligands, becomes split. Now, the electrons that are now in these boxes can now move between these boxes. These are called DD transitions. And that gap, this gap here, the energy of this gap is related E equals HV or HF, HV in chemistry, annoyingly, wave number. Yeah, HV. That energy is linked to the frequency of visible light. Now, they have said that the colors here are caused by FF transitions. That means that the F block must be splitting. So explain why the solution of lanthanides are colorless of, lamp of LA H209. So the very first one, I know this is odd and everyone always picks up on this, lanthanum. So lanthanum is, is technically in the D, but it, it's in like, but it's also got, it's way down here. This is where the, and the lanthanides begin. Hence the word lanthanum, yeah? Lanthanum is really the first one, an actinum. These are called the lanthanides and the actinides, everyone onwards, yeah? so. The reason why lanthanum, so this is the same reason as to why scandium is not colored. Yet scandium has no colors. Uh, the reason being is scandium forms a three plus with an empty D. There's nothing in the D. Well, lanthanum has got an empty F. There's nothing in it. So lanthanum three plus, L A is so hard. I'm, I'm really making massive leaps here as to whether, I don't know whether or not these are going to be correct. Lanthium, uh, non-aqua, non-aqua, lanthanum 3 plus, um, has no electrons, no electrons in the F subshell, in the F subshell. So uh, electrons, so electrons cannot become excited, cannot become excited, cannot go through FF transitions, cannot, ooh, electrons cannot go through FF transitions. That's all I'm gonna do. How are we doing? I'm nearly there. Nope, we're really not. Really not. How am I doing on time-wise? Unfortunately, about 12 minutes left. Nice. Hydrated cerium-4 ammonium nitrate contains this, 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 and this water crystallization. Ugh. Calculate the empirical formula of this compound and hence write an overall formula for the cerium ammonium nitrate and water molecules. Okay. So it's given us all of our data, run empirical as normal. Cerium, 23.97, change it to grams immediately. Nitrogen, 19.18 grams. Hydrogen, 2.05 grams. Oxygen, 54.8 grams. Does that add up to 100? I'm assuming it does. Looks like it does. Yeah, it's given us all the numbers. Over oxygen is 16, hydrogen is 1. Nitrogen's 14. What is cerium? 140.1. Right. Just want to do the calculator. 23.97 divided by 140.1 gives me 0 0.171. 19.18. 0 0.171. 0 0.171. 0 0.171. 
divided by 14 gives me 1.37, 2.05, 54.8 divided by 16 gives me 3.425. Divide them all by the smallest, 1.71. So 1, 1 serum, 0 0.171, 0 0.171, 0 0.171. Please don't skip over this process, by the way, guys, because these this is where the marks are. It's really common for students just to not write anything down, 8.0. Zero one, so it's eight hydrogen two point oh five oh five divided by naught point one seven one. Students don't write down all they're working out 12, 11 point nine eight, 11 point nine eight. So that's 12 oxygen 54. Nope, 3.425 divided by 0 0.171. I get an answer of 20. Point zero. Okay, so the empirical is cerium. Nitrogen eight, hydrogen twelve, oxygen twenty. Right now we need to come up with uh, a formula, water of crystallization. So we've definitely got a dot H two O here somewhere, and this is cerium ammonium nitrate. Now they've given us all the ions up here, but well, we know we've only got one cerium, so cerium. Now cerium is plus four. Now we're going to have cerium ammonium. So let's put on ammonium. And that's plus one uh, nitrate NO3. And that's one minus. Well, everyone here should agree, but that doesn't work. In any chemical formula, the positives balance the negatives. Would everyone agree with that statement? So what that now means is that I've got plus five here. The minimum number of nitrates that I need is five. So I'm going to put that in a bracket and go five. Now, I'll get rid of that silly dot because the dot shouldn't be there yet. Just, oh God, there we go. Nitrates minimum of five. Well, if I do that, do I have eight nitrogens? And the answer is no, I have six. So what I can do is if I, to get to eight, what I can do, because I've got six, if I double the ammoniums, and then I, at that point, I've now got two ammoniums, then what I can do is, that now makes a total of plus six. I now I cannot change the number of cerians. Yeah, I can now have nitrates at six, because that's minus six. That now cancels out. Now, what that means is, that now gives me the correct number of nitrogens. I have that. Now, the question is, do I have the right hydrogens? And the answer is no. I've got 12 there, and I have eight and oh that's clever eight plus two which is ten so i need two waters that will now give me 12 hydrogens right now i check my oxygens 20. six times three six twelve eighteen plus two is 20 and i'm done it's really hard folks that there i hope you understood my methodology that was hard that guys an organic compound X with the molecular formula C7H16O did not react with acidified potassium dichromate, but gave a color with cerium for ammonium nitrate. X exists as a pair of optical isomers to use the structure. Well, it needs to be a ligand, and they've mentioned acidified potassium dichromate, so I'm assuming, but it says it did not react with it, which means I need it to be a tertiary alcohol need to have this to be a tertiary alcohol because it can act as a ligand yeah but now the problem is i need the right number of carbons which is seven so do i just oh it needs to exist as a pair of optical isomers and i'm assuming that this one here is going to be optically active so first of all let's make one of these two carbons long and then one of them three carbons long right does that now all add up because now this carbon here is optically active because I've got one group, two groups, three groups, four groups. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it all adds up. I'm happy. Just put on all my pages. This has been a tough paper, guys. Paper five is hard. It's hard, it's hard. And then we've got to justify the answer. What? Um, okay, so justify your answer. Tertiary 
tertiary alcohols, alcohols resist oxidation, oxidation by acidified potassium dichromide. Acidified potassium dichromate. Acidified potassium dichromate, first one. Next thing, it is an alcohol. Alcohols can act as ligands. Alcohol can act, can act as ligands. Forming colors, forming colored complexes. Colored complexes with cerium. Yes, with cerium complexes with cerium. Next, um, optical isomers, uh, carbon, carbon starred with asterisks. I'm just going to go with carbon star. Has four different groups. Different groups. It is a asymmetrical, asymmetrical chiral. Giving all the words, <clears throat> carbon. Asymmetrical chiral carbon. Oh, I'm done. I'm feeling really cooked on this. How am I doing? We've got four minutes to finish. Last question. <sighs> and it's a long one. Oh, but then I am at the end. Oh, how long have I got? How long have I got? I've got three minutes and 36 seconds to finish. <laughs> okay. Um, an amount of paracetamol in a tablet has been determined by titration with cerium four plus ions, given the two equations. Outlined procedure, two tablets containing paracetamol were crushed and 0.8 grams of powder were added to dilute sulfuric acid. The mixture was heated under reflux until the hydrolysis was complete. The solution was made up to 125 centimeter portion, so there's a times by four somewhere. It was titrated against cerium four plus the concentration of this and the mean titer was calculate the percentage. Okay, so first of all, cerium four plus plus moles equals C, 0.1, times by the mean titer, 21.7, all over a 1,000, gives me, this is going to be the cerium 4 plus 0.1, is it yet, times by 21.7, all over a 1,000, I'm not going to make it, 2.17 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, let's put that over here, that's 2.17 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of him now the ratio is a two a two to one with this guy that then rolls to this guy which has a one to one with paracetamol so first thing i'm going to do i'm going to halve it so the moles of whatever that guy was four amino phenol so 2.17 times 10 to the minus three divided by two gives me divide that number by two Gives me 1.085 times 10 to the minus 3 of 2 amino phenol. But that then also then equals, because it's a 1 to 1 in the second equation, that is also equal to the moles of paracetamol. Now, paracetamol. Now, if that's the moles of paracetamol in the 25, I need to multiply this by 4. So times that answer by 4, times 4 gives me equals 4.34 times 10 to the minus 3 in 0 0.8 grams of it, because that was the total in 100, and that contained 0 0.8 grams of it. Now I need to work out the MR of paracetamol. Damn it, I'm not going to make it on time. I'm going to want to, oh, I'm never going to make it. It's never going to happen. Oh, my goodness. Um, 1 plus 16. Oh, um, benzene is 78 minus 2 because of two attachments. So it's going to be 76. So that's now 76 with two attachments. 76 plus 14 plus 1 plus 12 plus 16 plus 12 plus 3. 1 plus 16 plus 76 plus 14 plus 1 plus 12 plus 16 plus 12 plus 3 equals 151. Oh my goodness. So the number of moles is that in 0 0.8. So that's the number of, I shouldn't do that, number 0 0.83 moles. Right, times that by 151, four point, um, got on my calculator, 4.34 exponential minus three times by 151 gives me 0 
five grams. They wanted the percentage in it over the total of 0 0.8 grams times 100. Oh, I'm not going to make it. Not oh, divided by 0 0.8 times 100, and I get 81.9%. Did I make it? I bet I didn't. <sighs> I made it with six cents. <laughs> that was funny. Holy moly. Okay. I'm done. Let's mark it. <laughs> right. That was one tough paper, guys. Paper fives are hard. Don't care how you look at it. <sighs> Wowzer. No. Little papers. Oh, my goodness. That would that was crazy chemistry. That's, that was a lot of hard. I can't believe that. I've never seen them. Never seen the F block ever, guys. Uh, I have no idea if I'm going to get those right. Uh, we'll, we'll find out. Can't believe Kayun fixed one of my questions already, which was fab. Thanks for that, Kayun. It was very useful. Great. So let's be quick, folks. Benzene, 210. A. C. A. C. Well done. Got my six. <laughs> uh, C. 2.98. Yes. B, D, 9, D, 4, B, ethanol. There's Kayun catching it. Well done, Kayun. B, C, doing well. A, A, C, D, D, B, oh no, I made a mistake, damn it, oh, did they ask for it in acidic, did they go the wrong direction, I went in the wrong direction, didn't I, in the new, by considering the oxidation change, it may be shown that the volume of magnet required in the neutral situation is, damn, so did I get it wrong, in the acidic, so hang on a minute, 22.5 was manganese ions needed to oxidize that to there. And hang on a minute, so in acidic to Fe2, Mn2+, in neutral to magnesium 4+, it's because I have to multiply it. I know exactly where I went wrong there, guys, just to explain to you where I went wrong is because I didn't want to do it. The problem is, you see, is that you've got to multiply these to make them match. It was a one to five in the acidic because the one electron multiplies there. And then this one's, oh, still going to be one to, still times by three. What have I done wrong here? Have I just not done the maths properly? I just, I've done five to three. I should have gone in the other direction. Oh, no, but I thought it'd be less. It does say five over three, but then I've, that's the way I've written it. Three over five. You should need less in the in the neutral. But they're saying you need more. Oh, because it's providing fewer electrons. Oh, it's hard. I'm not even getting wrapped up in it, guys. I don't care. I'm sorry. I apologize for not explaining that enough. It's been a really long webinar. I just don't want to do it. So the point being is... That I, it makes total sense. What I was meant to do is, is the realization that in order, in order to change, if, if the iron three plus is becoming the iron two plus, if the iron two plus is going up to iron three plus, yeah. So do a correct way round. Solution of iron two. Um. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so the, the iron 3 plus is going to provide me with one electron. Now, the manganese is going from manganese uh, 7 plus, plus 7, to manganese 4 plus in the neutral. Yes? Yeah. Now, what that means is, the, in all, the, this one is going to give us three electrons, and the other one, the Mn plus 7 going to Mn2 plus, gives us five electrons. What this means is, 
in the acidic condition, it's giving five electrons to that and it's running it five times. So what that means is for every one of these, for every one of these, I get to convert five of those. So I'm going to need less MN7 plus here than I do with the other one. This one's only going to provide me with three. So I only get, so instead of running this five times in this equation, in this equation, I'm only going to run it times three, which means I need to keep adding more of these before it adds up. So uh, the question is how you then get to, oh, of course you do. It's the 25 plus the, the five over seven. Oh, is that right? Because I took it away. Yeah, I found the 22. Yeah, and I then divided it by three over five. Divide it by five, yeah, times by two, yeah, and then add that to twen 25. No, hang on a minute. Five, it was 22 was the solution of manganese, yeah, and then to get to 25. So what I need to do is I need to add another two-fifths to it. I need another two fifths because if that five to one gives us 22 and three to one gives us, I need to add another two fifths. Yes, to get to the end. Well, if 22 is three fifths, 22 divided by three times by two, add that on to 22. 36.67, 36.75. .7. That's hard, that guys. I wouldn't even bother with it for one mark. Waste of my time. It's horrible. It's grim. I just don't care enough. I would have been happily accepted that as, as uh, I didn't get it. The rest of them were relatively straightforward. It took me too long to get through the multiple choices it was. Potassium nitrate, platinum, iron 2 and iron 3 are one molar. Um, does it actually does, doesn't even mention, um, doesn't even mention solution containing iron 3 ions. Allows soluble compounds. Solution. Oh, no, 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 no. Iron 3. Oh, iron 3 and iron 2 ions. Yeah, okay. Uh, I should have actually put iron 3 and iron 2 nitrate one molar. I'm going to add that in as a, just a note there. It does say solution containing. I should have said iron 2 nitrate and iron 3 nitrate is what I should have done there. Add in the detail. I'm not going to give myself that. No. Next, equations. Half equation for the bismuth. Half equation in the overall. Fine. 0.7779. Yay. 0.779. Whatever. Did you do it? Problems. Curly arrows should go from the benzene ring. Horseshoe should be pointing towards the tetrahedral carbon. Curly arrow starts from the CH bond. Tin and HCl. They allow the formula. Should do. Should have said tin though. Mental note. Lone power on nitrogen. Uh, lone power nitrogen overlaps into the globalizing, interacts, incorporated. I prefer mine's better. Lone pair on nitrogen less accepting of H. Plus. Blue precipitate. Sodium nitrate, HCl, and 5 degrees C. Correct structure. Dial. Weird one. Nitrogen has restricted rotation. Mirror image. 60% methane. There. Weird question that. I get all four marks no matter how I do it really, but still. Do they want the equations? Oh, potassium dichromate and dioxalic acid. Oh, equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did give the equation. Yeah. And then hydrogen cyanide, nitric acid re reflux equation. Yeah. Oh, I didn't give the equation for the step two. I didn't think it said two, though. Equations for each of the steps. So I definitely lose one, guys. I forgot to do the equation for the cyanide one. I did the reduction. So I got all of those correct, except I didn't write my equation. So I lose one mark in my equation. Do I need the triether? Tetrahedral followed by, yeah, equation, that's fine. So, correct, yeah, so I got all but one mark. I forgot the equation. Lost one definitely there. Ligand exchange. 
click on substitution picture. Don't do what they did. Yellow, blue, green, not redox, both plus five. I didn't think I'm gonna get all four here, all five. Oh, maybe I will. Equation for cell for that, equation for return. Right? Yeah, yeah, they're putting them together. Yeah, it's okay. Yep, yep, that's fine. E cells, what's the fifth mark? Not oxidized further. Oh, okay. That makes total sense. I got all up, but I then needed to say why I chose it because it's that yes, why I chose it was because oh darn it, yeah okay, it won't take it further because that guy's more positive than what I had. Totally missed that. Yeah, happy to accept it. Oh, this has been a hard paper, guys. It's been tough. This I'm very fed up of it. Both increase the rate of reaction by providing alternative routes. Um, hydrogen is a different phase compared to reactants. Example, uh, Haber, example, hydrogen is, uh, so they didn't require any, any description. Oh no, there it is, mechanism of hetero. That adsorbs to catalyst surface, bonds weaken, reaction takes place, desorbed, yeah. Haber, homogeneous. What example do they give? Iron to an iron three and iodine for sulfate ions. Yeah, same as me, that's nice. Mechanism. Did I have to give a mechanism? Correct. Uh, no, not really, but I did anyway. And I then went on to explain that nightmare. Holmium. Yep. This was a mess. Right. Um, there is extra stability associated with a half full F sub subshell. Okay, next one, F5. Yes, thulium has 11 more protons. Um, in its nucleus, so there is a greater attraction to the nucleus. Fine. Lanthanides are larger than transition metals, so more space to fit on. And again, explanation that there is no F electrons in the lanthium 3 plus layer, has no electrons in the F subshell, so no FF transition can take place. <laughs> Empirical. Formula at the end, yeah. Whew. Tertiary alcohol, X is an alcohol, gives a red color with cerium. X is a tertiary alcohol, forming a complex. Uh, potassium dichromate, four different groups attached to carbon carbon. Kind of rushed this one, 81.9% still smashed it. <laughs> Nice. Right, guys, that has been a very long webinar. It is time for me to leave you guys be. Stop screen. Okay, back. Right, guys, that has been a very, very long webinar, and I am so done for the day. Paper six, not a chance. <laughs> I will see you guys tomorrow for paper six. See you later, everybody.